Gracious and creative spirit, we thank you for gathering us on this morning for worship, for prayer, for fellowship. May we be nudged and challenged to live closer and walk closer to you. May you open our minds and our hearts to new things that you are creating in our midst. Amen. Whether or not to eat food sacrificed to idols. At first glance, this passage could easily be one that we could pass over as ancient and irrelevant. However, this passage actually gets at the heart of the gospel, the rule of love, and it speaks importantly to what the heart of our community of faith should be. So how do we find contemporary relevance in an old debate over whether to eat food offered to idols? Our version of this debate in the 21st century would probably be like, do I want chicken, beef, or pork tonight? Is this beef grass-fed or grain-fed? Do I want regular bacon or turkey bacon? or the debate that rages between carnivores and omnivores, though who in, those who enjoy eating meat, including spam and haggis, and those who are vegan and proud of it because they help make for a better world and save the earth and its creatures. Now that's not quite where Paul's focus is in this passage. Paul focuses on how we might gauge the impact of our actions on the lives of others and how we might use the impact as a reason to restrict or change our own behavior. You see, in the early church in Corinth, it was a live debate about whether it was right or good to eat meat that remains after animal sacrifices have been made at pagan temples. At that time, sacrificing animals to the gods was an everyday event for those who worshipped idols, and the meat that was left was sold to others as food. In fact, it might have even been hard to find meat that had not been sacrificed to an idol. The new Christian so then had a problem. Should he take part in such a feast at all? It was like suddenly not going to the neighborhood party that Joe throws every week. They were afraid that if they ate the meat, they might be weak and might be tempted to be drawn back into that pagan worship. They didn't want to have anything to do with their former life, and so their choice was to not eat the meat. Their faith wasn't strong enough yet to offset the influences of the world around them. For others, they didn't care. It wasn't an issue. Why waste a good steak? Paul's take on the debate is that because idols have no real existence as actual gods, you had the freedom of whether to choose to eat the meat or not. For Paul, a piece of meat is a piece of meat. It doesn't matter if that meat was offered as a sacrifice to a pagan god in the temple. Eating it won't hurt you. There's no power in it to do damage to you or your faithfulness to God. But he knew that that's not the only consideration. Even if he himself didn't see anything wrong with eating that meat, if someone else saw a problem with it, as a fellow human being, he believed he had a responsibility to be sensitive to the other. A good example of this kind of sensitivity happened way back in the 1800s when most churches stopped using real wine for communion and started using grape juice. The Salvation Army leaders had come to the church leaders to point out, we have converts, new Christians, who came off the streets and have a problem with alcohol. We can't bring them to church for communion because even one sip of wine could make them fall off the wagon. Now the Salvation Army ended up founding its own church, which didn't even have communion at all, but by then most churches had changed to grape juice out of concern for brothers and sisters in Christ who struggled to stay sober. I'm sure there were many at the time who said, well, it doesn't bother me. How can one little sip make a difference? Another example is 
the fair trade coffee that we sell here at the church. When we know that the coffee beans we just bought at the store were picked in Guatemala or somewhere else where the workers are paid little and mistreated, we have a choice of whether to buy that coffee. Here at the church, it was decided that we would offer fair trade coffee because we are aware, at least in that instance, that our choices to eat something or buy something affects others. In these kinds of dilemmas, we can choose to just think about ourselves or think like family. For Paul, responsibility and relationship were always primary considerations. The Corinthians wanted to do whatever they pleased, and Paul taught them an alternative philosophy to their human nature. He knew that without a sense of responsibility, there is no freedom. Freedom is demanding. It is choosing whether to create or destroy, to love or hate, to be responsible or irresponsible. I can picture him pacing the floor in front of the groups who were deadlocked in disagreement, saying, the church is a family. We care about one another. We care about each other's welfare and feelings. We're not just a club or a social organization. Take responsibility for each other. Help each other out. You can't avoid being a role model. It makes a difference to your brother that you're eating that meat. He needs your help not to do that. Remember many years ago when Charles Barkley proudly announced that he was not a role model. That drove me nuts. Come on, Charles. You are a role model whether you want to be or not. And that's true of each one of us. We are role models to one another. What we do affects the people around us. And we are called to remember that love for one another is the acid test of our faith. The rule of love says if you have to choose between being loving and being right, be loving. If you see someone struggling or wavering on the brink of their faith in God, think about what you can do for that person on their terms, not on yours. People stand at different points in their understanding and in the strength of their relationship to God. So Paul's thinking was, for their sake and out of respect for their relationship to God, I'll act as if they're right, at least for now and in this case. And he takes that approach not out of condescension or self-righteousness, but out of his recognition that on a scale of one to a hundred, when we compare our understanding to the love and understanding of God, we all stand maybe at best on a two or at a five on a good day. Anyone who can only see how right I am and does not pause to consider the value and worth of those who think differently, misunderstands the gospel. Paul calls us to humility before God and our fellow human beings, to an awareness of the immensity of our own ignorance and the enormous extent of our capacity to be wrong. The two terms Paul are contrasting here are knowledge and love. And here, Paul is using knowledge in a negative sense. He's not speaking about knowledge in general, but a religious sophistication that is arrogant. It puffs up, as the passage says, and is opposite to the self-giving, compassionate, agape love of God that builds up community. Knowledge can be used as a sledgehammer to destroy relationships, whereas love promotes a healthy, vibrant, spiritual community. The question always in Paul's mind was, what does this mean for those around me and for my relationship to God? Think about what a different world we would live in if we truly understood the limitations imposed by love. In some ways, we get this. We get this more in our family relationships. Matt and I have been married for 16 years now, 
And in our marriage, we know some of the limitations imposed by love. For example, if some terribly handsome movie star should come to my office asking for pastoral care, I could pray with him, but I couldn't accept his invitation to go to the Bahamas for the weekend. Isn't that good? You can trust me on that. Our love for Maddie has imposed limitations on our life as a family. There are things that we give up and sacrifice so that she can have what she needs and we can do things as a family. Although Matt keeps talking about that blue 67 Firebird he wants and I just hope he waits until after she gets through college to get it. You know the limitations imposed by love for your spouse or your partner, your family, even your friends. And hopefully, we're trying to get it a little more as a church family. We do things for the ones we love. We make sacrifices and choices that we wouldn't make if we didn't have them. It becomes harder when our relationships are not as close when we dig our heels in and say, wait a minute, if someone has a weak conscience and doesn't like something, it's not my fault, it's his or her problem. I shouldn't have to give up my right to do something just because someone else can't handle their own issue. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever thought that? Because that's exactly the issue that Paul was speaking to in this passage. We might do those kinds of things if it's our spouse or a close friend, but really that person who sits on the other side of the sanctuary? Because the spiritual welfare of a brother or sister in Christ is more important than any right we might exercise. Did you hear that? What my relationship is to you is more important than any right I have, and vice versa. Relationship and responsibility. Love means that each one of us has to know that we have to be the one making the compromise. It is not somebody else who needs to compromise for us. These are the limitations imposed by love. Paul wasn't just naively saying, can't we all just get along? He wasn't saying to avoid conflict. In fact, he insisted that the issue be confronted, and the church was exactly the place for these difficult discussions. Every member of the community was to be taken seriously because knowledge does not belong to any one segment of the church. We must listen to one another, really listen, not in order to correct one another, but in order to learn from one another. Whenever we think we know something, that knowledge has the power to convince us that being right is the highest value, and that's when I get puffed up, and when you get puffed up. But the limitations imposed by love bursts our balloon and reminds us it is more important to be loving than to be right. The resolution of differences was important to the life of the church in Corinth. Their central act of worship was the Lord's Supper, eating a meal together. If they had allowed each one to do as their conscience directed them at this meal, their community would have been destroyed. It was a classic standoff between liberals who believed that they can eat meat, and conservatives who believed eating the meat was strictly forbidden. Surely there was a temptation to claim an irreconcilable impasse rather than to work for reconciliation. But to say irreconcilable would be an affront to the Christ who called us to be church together. So Paul reminded them to be on the lookout for the strong convictions of knowledge and the fervent passion of freedom that could puff them up and cut them off from one another. I wish Paul could be standing and pacing before our politicians. Don't you? No, you can't use the word irreconcilable impasse any longer. Perhaps he might have been able to break 
that impasse. When getting it right and winning the argument is foremost, whether it is a marriage, whether it is a friendship, whether it is a fellowship, we are lost. There is always more to consider than being right, but it is astounding how often that's what it comes down to. For a passage that seems pretty irrelevant, it is striking that Paul's words to the church in Corinth really has tremendous relevance for our day, calling us to recognize the limitations imposed by love and to play a reconciling role in our families and in our church family. It also helps us see our diversity and our differences as God's gift to us, a guard against self-righteousness and a reminder that God's ways are not our ways. We need one another to see the bigger picture and more fully discern the will of God. So may we continue to live within the limitations imposed by love in our homes, in God's house, and may we be blessed with a continuance of God's love that is big enough to embrace everyone. Thanks be to God. Amen.